Hi. Um, okay, this part is from the book by Mark S. Kopilovich, uh, The International Monetary Fund and the Global Economy, Banks, Bonds, and Bailouts. In fact, this is one of the few, uh, I'd say really the only book that I've found that really criticizes and goes to the heart <coughs> and crux of the problems. Again, why is nobody taking action in the legal community to start holding everybody over at the IMF to account? Uh, like I'm calling for. Okay, so the International Monetary Fund and the Global Economy. Of course, I'm not going to read the whole book, but this is the introduction, which does give a very, very good synopsis of what's going on. Uh, and <clears throat> this is the same analysis that I did, I mean, from a totally different perspective, uh, in the uh, spring 2006 IMF World Bank meetings. And this is when I saw, you know, started putting all the, 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 the dots together and I saw what their role in the entire banking and uh, systems and financial markets and how they're, <coughs> they're assisting all of the, the increasing high risk, high yield, and how they uh, are major players, particularly after 2008, major players in <coughs> sustaining that globally which uh, puts right again everybody in the in the organization into RICO and Foreign Corrupt Practices Act and Crimes Against Humanity and now with the COVID we're looking at genocide because I mean uh, the, the same issues within internal mismanagement bullying and the support of alpha dominance feminism and the, the vying for power of the different minority factions <coughs> coupled with managerialism, you know, get more and more and more experts and PhDs and MBAs and, and certificates. I mean, with the, the Institute for Capacity Development, all they do is, you know, churn out more of the, 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 the rhetoric and rhetoric and stuff that these people should have learned a long time ago. Same with World Bank. I've seen that with the online uh, <coughs> training courses that they're doing. It, 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 it's, it's ridiculous. And it's ridiculous that nobody is saying anything. And nobody's calling them out. I mean, this is what the IMF Family Association World Bank Family Network and UN LESA should these, you know, grapple up the ladder of success, uh, nouveau riche, ruling elite in Washington, women should be, excuse me, uh, no, uh, things are going pretty downhill. But since all of these experts married a bunch of bimbos and if you look at all the profiles all of them you know every 10 15 years they they can they you know trade in the old model for a new model uh you know 10 or so years younger a lot of them is so they can get you know have more children and and oh look what a wonderful father i am i mean the the the, the men are playing it as much as the women to, oh, look at what an upstanding family I am, whether it be the right or the left. And this is when I get everybody into court. Uh, yeah, well, um, we'll be doing a lot of psychological testing on how uh, functional all your narcissistic, all you narcissists of my generation uh, are, as well as the kids that you've produced. 
and and how they're just preparing to cash in on all of this and universities are just being flooded the kids don't care whether they learn anything in school they know they just got to get that diploma that's why you're seeing you know these cases in hollywood of of you know people going to court and we'll see a whole lot more of that but also all of these universities it, it, it's just a, a con job of managerialism because it's churning out and churning out and churning out all of these phds and mbas uh who don't understand what they're doing and this is where i make an example of Charmini curry and all of the uh deputy directors at the imf well, the Institute for Capacity Development. I also go out Olivia Blanchard, that I saw in 2010, when he said, oh no, the 2008 collapse was only a, an isolated incident and not part of a, a bigger trajectory. Uh, who else? Well, Christine Lundard, and never put her money where her mouth was, and lots and lots of empty rhetoric, and you see with Charmini Curry, <clears throat> no, things are just getting worse. And with Gina Paoni. And she's over there at, now at HR as changing management or something in the digital age. See, the IMF is just in bed with the techie liberalism and the Bill Gates and all of that little, little, little crowd of friends. It's a, it's a very... Yeah, I mean, it, it hasn't changed. It's still the, 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 the club of who has the money and who has the power. Just the, the, the skin color and the names and the, 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 the gender of the people have changed. And Betty Friedan said in 1981, uh, this is not what I had in mind, ladies. You need to go into the workforce, change the rules of the game rather than get in there and play by the same scumbag games. So the, the feminists have got on board and all of the different minorities have got on board. So anyway, okay, the, Inter the International Monetary Fund and the Global Economy, introduction. This is a book about the impact of globalization on international politics. To be more specific, it is a book about the connection between changes in the composition of international capital flows and changes in the politics and policy making of the International Monetary Fund, IMF, or fund. The central institution of global financial governance. Financial globalization, the explosive growth in, growth in the size, depth, and complexity of international markets is the defining characteristic of the contemporary world economy. Indeed, international financial integration today has reached and in many ways surpassed levels not seen since the first globalization. In the era prior to World War I, over, see, this goes back to the, the you know, the, the, the Gilded Age and the expansionism that was going on there and really the Americans and Europeans with the, the, the Germans at the lead. They were, uh, they kind of, when the British kind of self-destructed from their imperialism, <coughs> the Germans really became, uh, you know, superior in, in, in industrialization. And, um, you know, that's, that's what eventually it was World War I, then World War II, but it was always about economics and money and vying for, for uh, uh, you know, industrialization, manufacturing, manufacturing um, dominance. And this is where we need to shift from this, this uh, <coughs> industrialization, industrialization, urbanization, urbanization, <coughs> and have a balance 
between our urban populations and our agrarian populations because we've had such a concentration into urban um, areas for well since the industrial revolution of course we saw it before but <clears throat> this has a lot to do with the industrial revolution and that's got to stop because the techie revolution has just jumped on board of being this this predatory uh, you know uh, community and industry uh, so again we need to get back the techy liberalism the industrialization liberalism um, which is why the, the, the capital is concentrated in a small group of hands of people who don't know how to look at any evidence, anybody, any more than anybody else in their different professions, whether it be the economists over at the IMF, the World Bank, the human rights people, uh, the legal community, everybody's out to lunch. Over the last decades, private international capital flows to developing countries have grown exponentially. From nearly zero to 1970, to 491 billion in 2005. So, you know, this is a lot of money that's that needs to be uh, oversight on how, you know, the capital markets, the financial systems, uh, the business communities who have the access to those uh, capital markets. This is this is where oversight of the IMF comes in, rather than sitting around waiting for a crisis to, to happen and then step in, like Christine Lagarde said at the, it was a, a con, you know speech she did. I think it was a Kennedy. Harvard Kennedy School, or it was with Larry Summer introduced her, but she said, "Oh yeah, it, it, you have to really kind of wait until a crisis to get anybody to move. Got to stop that. You got to start doing prevention rather than just crisis management after crisis management after crisis management." <sighs> Daily foreign exchange trading has increased <coughs> from 850 billion in 1986 to 3.2 trillion in 2007. In the first quarter of 2007, commercial banks reported 25 trillion, this is in dollars, US dollars, in total foreign claims up from 17 trillion in 2005. At the same time, in international investors held over 20 trillion in sovereign and private bonds with net issuance increasing at a rate of 18 percent per year unfortunately as starkly illustrated by both the current global crisis and the major upheavals of the 1980s and 1990s this resurgence of financial globalization has been accompanied by a corresponding increase in the frequency and severity of financial crises. I mean, I, I started my, my you know, career after college. I worked in a, up on Capitol Hill while I was on, in college and got disgusted with that. Um, in the financial markets and I wasn't there for very long but I you know I learned a lot uh, I got three I think three promotions before Yvonne we said oh gosh you guys I need to leave you people are worse but I was there for the 87 collapse uh, I was working for George Schwelling he had the dividend rollover program and I learned a lot from him about well 
<coughs> Chuck Yuri was much more, you know, he was the one who picked the stocks. He was the, 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 the hands-on. George Schwelling was just the, the salesperson. See, this is, you, you, you do need, this is good in partnerships. My ex-husband wasn't so, you know, determined to be in the limelight or my siblings. I mean, my, my sister, all she knows how to do is cheerlead. If she wanted to be on this, that would have been fine. And we, we would be sitting, you know, multi-billionaires. But, you know, I mean, uh, my younger sister, she's just like my mother. It's all about power and control, all about power and control. I mean, all of them have hung me out to dry, and it's all to, you know, so that, uh, uh, you know, not help me find a job. I mean, in Washington, it's 85% of the jobs are through cronyism. Now, particularly my brother, I mean, my, my younger sister, she's a celebrity chef of the stars in Tallyride, Colorado. Now, why can't I even get more than a hostessing job in Washington when I'm um, just as good a cook as her, as not, if not better? I just didn't make any money off of it. I was always doing it for my ex-husband. You know, she, anytime I want to find out what the feminists are saying about the, the, the deposed trophy wives and the homemakers, pick up the phone and call my sister. <laughs> She'll give me an earful of what a, what a useless idiot I am. But it's going to come bite her in the ass when all of this comes out. And <clears throat> no, uh, excuse me, the, the, the narcissistic idiot here uh, is you. So the macroeconomic, the macroeconomic impact of these crises has been dramatic and severe. Has any of you guys been watching for the past 30, 40 years? Oh. Cross country estimates suggest that the output losses resulting from recent crises have on average equaled over 10% of GDP, while the fiscal costs of resolving banking crises in developing countries exceed $1 trillion in the 1980s and 1990s. The damage caused by financial crises has also, also has real and costly implications for individuals, of course. Crises nearly always result in severe inflation and rising unemployment, both of which undermine living standards and contribute to rising levels of poverty in crisis-stricken countries. Furthermore, government bailouts of failed banks can result in dramatic reductions in social spending. And bank failures can eliminate the savings of millions of citizens. For example, many of these adverse effects were starkly apparent during the height of Argentina's financial crises in 2001-2002, <clears throat> when unemployment rates approached 25% poverty rates surpassed 50% and the collapse of several major financial institutions wiped out the savings of many middle-class Argentinians. Uh, you know, I saw the 2008 collapse coming. It was 2006-2007. I was working on a blog for expats to explain them how they they uh, increase their risk uh, when they buy a home abroad because they expose themselves to the real estate fluctuation risk as well as a currency rate fluctuation risk. So you're, you're, you, you, you kind of double your risk there. You got to look at the not only the real estate but your currency uh, markets. And <clears throat> Argentina was one of the case studies. It was Argentina, Colombia, uh, and, and Spain. I mean, not at the same periods because Spain had been earlier, 
but <clears throat> you saw the, 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 the same trends and the same problems and, you know, we see it everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. Closer to home, the fallout from the subprime mortgage crisis has had substantial real effects on the U.S. economy. <clears throat> Unemployment and home foreclosures are on the rise. Economic growth has ground to a halt. And millions of individuals have seen their retirement savings washed away as financial markets have collapsed. The model that everybody wants to promote, including IMF, World Bank, UN, uh, everybody else in Washington, and everybody, you know, all of the, uh, really all of the government officials, because uh, everybody's just vying for their piece of the pie, uh, is, is, is unsustainable. You know, uh, and this is why it's gonna end up very badly for everybody if they don't wake up and spend the coffee. Get rid of the game players. Uh, you got to make a capitalist systems really capitalist where you have, um, you know, free flow of money to given to projects that first people have done their homework rather than you just pick up a phone like Trump says, ah, oh, I need some money, I just pick up the phone and call, you know, what's his name? So, the business community not, needs to start, you know, getting to work and getting out of their ivory towers and stop screwing around and look at different projects, the, 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 not only the viability of it financially, but also uh, if this is doing, uh, you know, a healthy contribution to the global economy and to local economies and national economies and, 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 and stop with just throwing 100 million here, 100 million there for, 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 you know, you got the right connections, you can get 100 million like that in the capital of interest. If you don't have the best plan in the world, you can have all sorts of stuff. You won't get it. I mean, I, I've demonstrated that in, in looking for the money in the United States, Spain, and France. I would have started, I, you know, 2012 or 13, and finally I was like, okay, fine, in 2015, okay, I, I've run the gamut here. So about three years, you know, of email after email and checking everybody who's in the game and contacting them and contacting them. I mean, all sorts of people said, oh gosh, yeah, this is a good uh, project, but nobody will help me. Uh, Cause I'm not some thicky kid. And I've been out of the game. And my ex-husband, who, you know, was a banker, I mean, logically, if this had been a sustainable, sane world, my ex would help me get the money through his contacts in the financial system, banking systems, and we'd be sitting pretty. But no, his obsession of power and control is much more important, just as with my family. My mother, my siblings, it's the, now that my parents and my father's passed, my siblings are playing the same game with me as my mother always played, and always played with my father. You see, this is, this is not, this, this narcissistic, uh, psychopathic paradigm controlled by a bunch of alpha dominance, feminist, crazy women, but well, that's who's gotten into control. It is driving everybody off a cliff. And all the men have been too castrated to do anything about it. We see that exactly very well at the Institute for Capacity Development. With Sharmini Curry, Gina Peoni, Anna Day, Kate Phillips, Adrian Thapa, Elizabeth Elliot. See, you know, you keep everybody in the echelon 
stupid and narcissistic. They create chaos all over the place. And then nobody, everybody is, oh, I'm just going to keep my head down and I'm just going to punch the clock and I'm not going to get involved. And that is the, 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 the paradigm. I, I, you know, you see this everywhere. Everywhere I've been working, I'm seeing the same thing. And it's really destroying uh, labor markets and our workplaces. And the rule of law in this country because people are getting pissed off but they have no recourse in the courts and part of the problem has been the war on drugs that has eroded the rights of people in this country ergo the IMF World Bank and UN employees are assisting in the degradation of rights labor rights or rights of women and children within the home or family uh, for financial gain uh, and in, 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 you know, in detriment to this country and detriment to the world. And that is not their mission. Their mission is exactly the opposite. More broadly, financial distress, distress in one country can have severe consequences for broader regional and global financial stability. This risk of cross-border financial contagion has increased dramatically in recent years. As a result of the surge in global financial integration, and capital mobility. <clears throat> See, I mean, even I keep on saying to everybody, stop calling me stupid. Stop calling me ugly, fat, and stupid. Now, you got a problem with anything I'm saying. We can sit down and discuss it. But if all you do is insult me, and scream at me and you know try and ostracize and marginalize me uh, well no uh, sorry I really don't have anything to discuss with you I mean, just sit there and listen to you insult me scream at me no sorry sorry I got other things to do with my life so if anybody wants to discuss any of these issues, that's more than, than fine. I have a Skype account. I mean, I'm, I'm doing, you know, you can do it on Zoom. Fine. But this, ignore her till she goes away and keep on, you know, ostracizing her and calling her names and spitting on her. Uh, not doing you any good. In fact, it's it's really going to come and bite you in the ass when we finally get to the end of the line and the people stand up and say enough is enough. <clears throat> you all need to be held to account. <sighs> Indeed, sharp reversals in the direction and magnitude of international bank lending and bond financing now frequently transmit financial instability from one market to the next with nearly unprecedented speed. So it went worse and worse. The more you get into the digital age, uh, the Bitcoin thing, oh, you can see on the, the, the thumbnail and, uh, that I have, you see the, the the graph and then when the Bitcoin comes in it starts going and what the F so for example the collapse of cross-border interbank lending in 2007-8 as a result of the subprime mortgage crisis in the United States 
led directly to the failure of Northern Rock, the eighth largest bank in the United Kingdom, and the dramatic collapse of Iceland's economy. Have any of you guys ever at the World Bank or IMF looked at what happened with the whole Iceland case study? Do you guys ever learn from any mistakes that are being out, made out there? Or no, you're too stupid and you got too many dumb bimbos at your side uh, just trying to grapple up the ladder of success. So figure it out. And just keep on, you know, stumbling over the same stone time and time and time. Similarly, Thailand's financial and currency crisis in mid-1997 rapid, rapidly escalated into a global problem as international investors pulled their money out of South Korea, Indonesia, and other e Asia, East Asian markets, and instability spread to a number of Eastern European and Latin American countries. In short, cross-border financial crises have become a defining feature of the international financial system over the last three decades. In this environment, the IMF has occupied central stage in efforts to manage these crises and restore global financial stability. Above all, the fund's key role has been that of de facto international lender of last resort, L-O-L-R. Uh, everybody loves acronyms. Just come up with another plan, with another acronym, and we throw it out there, and we launch a huge sales pitch, and we melt the taxpayers to foot the bill. It has served as a source of emergency financing to countries facing financial and cur currency crises or an inability to repay their international debt. Since the onset of the Latin American debt crisis in 1982, the IMF has provided over $400 billion in such loans to developing countries. More loans, more loans, more loans. With nobody spending money responsibly. Because all of the ruling elite in all of these countries have been, have jumped on board with the narcissism epidemic that the Americans start, started in 1980 under Nancy Reagan on the right and Cornelia Guest and, and all of the, the, the cocaine snorting cheerleaders, uh, you know, libertines. So they don't wanna, you know, that the exact same as the flappers in this way, they don't, you know, they're too busy partying to, to, to see what's going on in their communities and, and societies. And as such, they're, they're nothing but, you know, parasites and whores. I mean, the parasites, I've been treated like the parasite on society by the courts, by labor markets, by my, you know, by my family, by, you know, my younger sister. She's this, you know, bankruptcy building uh, billionaire. <laughs> Uh, they take lots and lots of zeros off of that and her net debt is you know she's like Trump my older sister you know hanging out in the country club and cashing in on all of this she lives a much better life in Colombia than she ever would be able to afford in the United States uh, so you know she and my brother is, you know, Chicago high rise, works for a, an insurance agency. Well, it's an insurance company. Um, and, you know, it's like, where, where are all of his contacts? 
you know, through Woodbury Forest, uh, Tulane, all of these, you know, I'm sure a lot of his friends who are lawyers are going to be facing some serious problems. I see this is, this is where all of the conflict of interest comes in within the 10 percenters who have been grappling up the ladder of success for the past 30, 40 years and uh, have some guilty consciences and some skeletons in their closet that they want to, they don't want to be discovered. So, of course, they're not going to help anybody who's going to expose all of that. All they care about is they've been able to cash in for the past, you know, 20, 30, 40 years, and uh, I'm good. I'm good. So nobody else cares. matters. <sighs> Let's see. Um, in this environment, the IMF has occupied center stage in efforts to manage these crises. In, oh, I'm sorry, I already read that. Since the onset of the Latin American debt crisis in 1982, the IMF has provided over 400 billion such loans to developing countries. Most recently, the fund has lent more than 85 billion in credit to 18 countries, including Belarus, Hungary, Iceland, Latvia, Pakistan, Romania, and Ukraine, hit hardest by the global credit crunch. Now this was 2010 when this, this book was published. In exchange for this assistance, the fund has gained substantial control over economic policy making in its borrower countries through its use of conditionality. The policy reforms it requires in return for credit. The IMF's role, and, and you know, this is not, if it was being done, if you know, these, these measures were being done by, you know, caring people who cared about populations and economies and, 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 and economic stability rather than just their own pocketbooks and, you know, grappling up the ladder of success in their careers, then, you know, all of these measures could be justified. But since they are just as much the motor behind the, 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 the increasing income inequality and the corruption within the markets and covering all of that up with fancy speeches and, you know, David Lipton saying corruption's not everywhere. Oh, I can't wait to see David Lipton up on the stand. Jennifer Shadak. I think some crazy and David Lipton is, you know, untouchable. And God, that little lady's up for a rude awakening. Real rude. In short, let's see. Oh, I already did that. The IMF's role as lead crisis lender in the global economy has transformed it into one of the world's most powerful multilateral institutions. Now, uh, with power comes obligation and responsibility to be held to account for what you are doing and the actions that you are taking and the consequences of those actions on economies and how you're milking the taxpayer with, you know, Institute for Capacity Development, $330 million training program, and rah, 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 everybody's going sustainable development goals, sustainable development goals, uh, it's gonna go down the same road as trickle down for the same reason, because your ruling elite are a bunch of a narcissistic game plan hypocrites, whores and pimps. That's, that's 
you know, who have control. So, you know, we are either with them or against them. There's only two sides to this, this, this war at present. You're either with the Four Reich or you want to help dismantle it. No, uh, no, 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 you know, in that, yeah, it needs, we need to, you know, this extremism of I'm not going to budge. Now, how we arrive at that can be through healthy debate between the right and the left. If everybody calm down from their freaking ivory towers and start getting rid of all of the game players in their, their respective organizations. Uh, at the same time, however, the fund's central role in global financial governance has subjected it to a firestorm of criticism in developing countries and the industrialized world alike. For obvious reasons, and all the reasons I go into in all of my blogs and all of my reports, since uh, I did the, the financing for development a Midsummer Night's Dream in 2015 when I was still working at the Institute for Capacity Development. People don't care about any These people don't care about any of that. All they care about is, is cashing in. I worked with these people for four years. It's a joke. They promote bullying and mismanagement within the organization, then they hire a bunch of, you know, experts like the Winter Group to do uh, respectful workplace, which promotes the bullying. I mean, my lord, when I saw that, I was like, you people are crazy. It's all included in my report, Workplace Bullying in the IMF, that I submitted to management, to HR, to the mediator, to the ombudsman. I mean, I'm, I'm doing everything just like I did at the State Department, just like I did at the White House, Congress. I'm doing everything according to the, the, the rules. Demonstrating, you know, people are a bunch of freaking idiots and hypocrites because, uh, no, none of you are doing what you're supposed to be doing. And in fact, you're all just covering everything up, covering everything up, covering everything up, so you can cash in. I mean, Joseph Stichglitz was, was asked to leave the, the World Bank because they didn't like his, his you know, rhetoric. Joseph Stichglitz is, is right on target on a lot of stuff that needs to be done in this country. I mean... I'm sure if Joseph Stichglitz was reading everything that I'd say, he'd agree with me. But he's too busy in the cesspool. He's on, oh Lord, how many boards of NGOs is he on? And how many books is he cashing in on making? On publishing? So see, everybody, everybody's too busy cashing in. Uh, the IMF's <coughs> critics have assailed it for a variety of shortcomings, including failing to maintain global financial stability, misdiagnosing the causes of <coughs> and solutions to financial crises, exacerbating poverty in the developing world, and developed world and catering to the demands of Wall Street bankers and rich country governments. This is my big beef. That's what I went into in my analysis of the, the, the IMF World Bank spring meetings in 2015. And why I was just, I was like, you people are out of control. Everybody's out of control. I told the same thing. My, my siblings 
<clears throat> these critics intensified in the aftermath of the major financial crises of the mid to late 1990s. As numerous academics and policymakers advocated the radical curtailment of the IMF and its lending policies. Indeed, even those deeply involved in shaping global policy responses to these crises, such as former U.S. Secretary, uh, U.S. Treasury Secretary Robin, Robert Rubin, called for substantial reform of the international financial architecture in order to avoid the need for future large-scale IMF loans and to enhance global financial stability in the coming decades. In short, virtually no one in today's global economy is happy with the IMF. And almost everyone has a proposal for how it should be reformed. Is anybody looking at any of this? I don't think so. The policy debate about the IMF's role in governing the global financial system is important. But it has developed in the absence of a full and clear understanding of how the fund operates and makes policy decisions. That's what I've provided in the past years. Uh, in fact, analytical studies of the IMF and its policies are surprisingly limited given the amount of ink devoted to more normative critics of the fund. Nobody wants to get involved. Nobody wants to go up against the IMF, except George Trolley. I mean, you know, it's you guys. I'm on the home court here with the IMF. I worked there for seven years. I mean, okay, Congress. I, you know, that goes back to the '80s. So I'm sort of on the home court there. But you know, I was that was a home court a long time ago. And I'm also in my home court in Washington, D.C. against all of you foreigners. You want to play Machiavellian games with me? Well, guess what you forgot to think about? Was uh, when you lose the support of the people, your house of cards comes collapsing. Crashing down. And you're very, very easily removed by another Machiavellian uh, game player. So everybody wants to play hardball with me for the last 15 years. I warned everybody at the very beginning. I'm not a stupid bimbo. Never was. Never will be. So, uh, yeah. It's taken me a long time to figure out the whole how the whole house of cards is constructed and who all the players are and I, you know, my lord, you know, yeah, 15 years of working 24-7, no vacations or anything like that, uh, but believe me, uh, my mom, no vacation, uh, at least I always got to see my dad, that was the, the, the positive side of it, but, um, just angers me and saddens me how he lived how he finished his life because of all of you people who want to play the narcissism game and grapple up the ladder of success just like my, my family my siblings you know uh, 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 I'm like okay well I'm just waiting to find out how many of them um, and this goes you know with with everybody I know the, the ruling elite in Europe and the United States everybody's just uh, thwarting this they're just you know following Trump's example of oh it'll just go away it doesn't you know it doesn't concern me We'll see how many of them die of COVID. I mean, yeah. 
Uh, so. Okay, uh, this gap, everybody talks about the gap. I don't have any gaps. This gap in the political economic economy literature is problematic <clears throat> in view of the substantial variations in the IM, IMF's lending policies over the last two decades. During this period, many of the IMF's loans have far exceeded the standard amount of financing these borrowers were eligible to receive under the fund's quota-based credit system. Others, however, were substantially smaller in size. Similarly, the fund's use of conditionality has varied greatly over the last 20 years, with some loans containing only a handful of conditions, while others require the borrower country to implement a wide variety of economic policy reform in exchange for IMF credit. <clears throat> Come on. Until very recently, explaining the variations in IMF lending was a topic of interest only to academic economists, central banks, and economic policymakers. <coughs> yeah, and all the ruling elite women are too busy uh, grappling up the ladder of success, hanging out at the country clubs, and going to parties to notice. Well, I've noticed. I'm not out to lunch like all of these ladies. Oh, I see what's going on. By and large, the economics and policy literatures treat the fund as an apolitical institution whose policies are set by its staff of macroeconomic experts based on a combination of country-specific and global macroeconomic factors. Variations in IMF lending, in this view, is simply the result of cross-national differences in borrower countries, financial needs, and economic characteristics, as well as changes over time in global financial conditions such as world interest rates and levels of financial stability. This technocratic view of IMF lending contracts starkly with popular perceptions of the fund, however. The conventional wisdom among, among the media, politicians, and general public, public is that the fund is an overtly political institution. Yeah, and they're meddling in U.S. politics and, you know, supporting the rise to power of, of Donald Trump with their political meddling with me. I mean, I keep on telling everybody, uh, you, you better be careful with all of your bullying and denigration and ostracization and marginalization of me when uh, we're, 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 we're uh, touching on political issues. Because that gets into political persecution and freedom of speech issues. So, you know, uh, all you guys at the Institute for Capacity Development want to get on board the little gravy train that I got going on there for uh, Charmony, uh, Gina Paoni, Anna Day, Kate Phillips. <coughs> oh, I want to slow secretaries. I mean, you know. Elizabeth Elliot, you think that she left is going to change anything? Oh no, oh no. Oh, believe me, all of the cackling I had to put up with, I'm going to be very, very happy to see that girl squirming on the stand answering some hard questions. Your assistants should be understanding this crap. I mean, I know you experts don't understand it, so that's why you have stupid assistants that don't understand anything. 
and have just gotten there, you know, through cronyism and are consolidating their power bases through the bullying and, and all of that. You want to support that? Well, then go ahead. But you are complicit to the crimes that are going on in your, 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 your respective, you know, areas and departments. And you can keep on moving people around and moving people around like you do and think that you're going to, you know, that way, then the problem, you know, we'll just move it someplace else. Uh, sorry. You're just moving your cancer from one place to another. Nevertheless, there is considerable, considerable disagreement about the nature of politics within the IMF. Some observers accuse the fund of being a pawn or lapdog of the government of the United States. And of course they are. That's what I'm proving. I mean, I want to see the United States in the international courts. I've been building cases for 15 years. So what does the IMF do and all of the employees do? They try and shut me up and denigrate me and ostracize me. This is political persecution in order to sustain the, the, the status quo of an oppressive American government. In this view, the IMF provides bailouts. Everybody gets a bailout. Everybody gets a bailout except the people i.e. large loans on lenient terms to countries deemed important by the U.S. Treasury or national security officials whether or not such policies are warranted by economic conditions. One of the things that I heard, and this is the thing, one of the, 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 the bailouts for companies is they can go and get loans. That's just going to, and there was actually some guy from a company who was, you know, was like, well, you got a brain. Thank you very much. He said, wait a second. If I take out a loan, I'm indebting myself even more. And I'm not having the customers that I had before. So this is going to end up digging these companies into a, a, a debt hole that they'll never be able to get out of. Some of this stuff needs to fail. For example, the restaurant industry, you know, the, the, the airline industry, all of this stuff that's, you know, contributing to global warming. Don't bail them out. Let them fail. And you put the money into resources for the companies that, that we need for the, the green economy, uh, all of these different things we need reforms across the board and that's where leadership should be coming in which of course it's not because everybody in Washington is too busy buying for their piece of the pie ¿Quién ha llevado mi queso? in contrast others attack the fund for being a runaway bureaucracy yeah I can confirm that <clears throat> neither accountable to its member states nor responsive to the needs of its borrowers. Well, that's what I've been de demonstrating with proof and names of people who are implicated. Now, why will no one help me bring them to the account in the media <clears throat> or in the courts? Because they're all complicit to the BS. <clears throat> Former U.S. Senator Lotch Faircloth, Republican, North Carolina, articulated this view most colorfully during the Asia, Asian financial crisis when he attacked the fund as a set of silk-suited dilettantes given to a diet of champagne and caviar at the expense of the American taxpayers. Well, it's not just the Americans, it's taxpayers around the world. For the pimps and their whores 
the schmooze and cruise, go to a whole bunch of meetings, give a whole bunch of conferences, produce a whole bunch of reports, while their wives are busy spending, 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 and hanging out at the country club and buying all of the, the, the you know, beauty products and, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the manufacturing goods, the luxury goods, and, and, you know, on taxpayers' dime. This is fraud. From this perspective, the IMF is yet another example of the threat posed by globalization to national sovereignty and government's economic policy autonomy. While recent studies in international political economy provide some empirical support for each of these political views of the IMF, scholars continue to disagree about the key economic and political detriments of fund lending behavior. Indeed, despite the recent surge in scholarly work on the IMF, many critical questions about the fund and its policies remain unanswered. What explains the substantial variation in the size and terms of IMF loans? To what extent is IMF lending driven by political factors rather than economic concerns? Why does the fund treat some countries more generously than others? And why does this vary over time, even for individual borrowers? In, those, in, in whose interests does the IMF act? Their own interests, their own pocketbooks. You know, the, each faction uh, vying for its piece of the pie. And cash in, cash in, cash in. Let's produce a lot, a lot of jobs. Doesn't matter what kind of jobs. I mean, you know, we got lots of little whores that are coming out of the, 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 the and pimps um, from the frat houses and, and the universities that are being thrown into the market. They've, you know, they've all... Straight A's, straight A's, straight A's, but they don't understand, believe me. I remember the nerds, all of you nerds that are my age. One of the problems with all of you nerds is that when you spend so much time at school getting straight A's, straight A's, straight A's, well, you don't, you don't develop a, a well-rounded personality. And, you know, you're uh, this, this... You got to get straight A's, straight A's, get into the best schools, get into the best colleges, then get these high-powered jobs so you can cash in. Uh, it's in their own interests. It's, it's, it's not for the common good, and it's not for the, the, the general welfare in violation of the U.S. Constitution. U.S. Bill of Rights, Democratic Principles, and just about every international convention out there. I mean, as I say, if anybody has a problem with any of my argumentation or any of my contentions, I'd be more than happy to sit down and explain everything to you in detail. But you want to insult me? You want to scream at me? I uh, can start beating me up. I imagine that's going to be the next, uh, you know, tactics. Um, it is what it is, but it's not going to change what I've seen. The evidence is exposing. I know how to look at evidence. I know how to put everything together. And if you guys over there we come down from our little ivory towers, maybe we could move forward instead of just, I'll see you in court. I'll see you in court. You know, you're, you're totally intransigent. You know, it's your way or the highway. You know everything. 
Nobody in this world knows anything. Uh, well, I'm sorry. This is this is this is exactly the problem with the mediation process all over the courts, whether it be in in, in you know the courts or within the schoolyards or workplaces. You you it's your way or the highway. I, I mean, mediation is not letting some bully beat the crap out of, out of the victim and waltz in and say to the victim oh well you know let's sit down and negotiate that you're gonna let the bully beat you up uh no sorry you know that's not governance that's complicity to the crimes that are going on and this is what's trickling down this whole attitude of you know uh, i'm just out for myself and i'm just cashing in and you know I, the, the world be damned not my problem i'm good i'm good well no you 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 when you work for a government agency or a pseudo government agency you work for the people and you're going to have to be accountable to the people. More broadly, what do the politics and policies of the IMF tell us about the dynamics of policy making within international organizations in general? We're seeing how who, who World Organization dropped the ball uh, with the COVID stuff. They should have been on top of that and should have been on top of all of the different uh, countries. But since everybody's in bed together, nobody gets on top of each other. <laughs> Except when they're literally in bed together, but that's another uh, can of worms. Uh, this book offers answers to these empirical and conceptual puzzles. So, uh, well, I, I, I won't go into all of this. The argument in brief. Because it, it, in brief, it is a couple of pages. But um, my central argument in this book is that the IMF's lending policies have varied systematically over the last decades in response to changes in patterns of financial globalization. Variations in the composition of private international capital flows, I, have, I argue, have shaped the preferences of both the fund's largest shareholder countries and its professional staff economists over IMF lending decisions. In turn, changes in these actors' preferences explain variations in the size and terms of fund loans over time and between cases. Thus, IMF lending is not a technocrat technocratic process, rather the fund is highly political institution whose policies depend on the interests of not only its largest shareholders but also its bureaucrats both of whom exercise partial but incomplete control over IMF policy making in order to explain the politics of IMF lending it is therefore necessary to understand how the comp composition of international capital flows has changed over time as well as how these changes affect the preference of the key actors involved in fund decision making. Now, this kind of gets into my beef with the IMF uh, staff association. Now, the family association should be on the ball, but they're not. They're asleep at the wheel. And the staff association is just as much asleep at the wheel, too busy, you know, all they care is being on the staff association board helps and this is with the IMF family association it helps the, the have your wife on the board it's gonna you know help your career you, you know you, you your wife is more known within the IMF and um you know that's why Anne Beatrix Keller jumped at the the, the the opportunity to grab all of the glory of all of my hard work because it would, you know, launch her into stardom. 
but everybody who who was complicit to all of that i mean these, these are are these are criminal infractions uh that you all have gotten involved in in my case so uh you know whatever this hey it is what it is there's two sides to this you want to you want to pick the side of the oppressor you want to pick the side of the empire builders you want to pick the side of the bullies uh the rapists the pedophiles the murderers uh the list goes on and on of what i'm combating um okay but uh when the end comes i will be seeing you all in court and you will be held to account for what 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 you're involved in in this protection racket because that's what it is well, as i've shown under rico uh well i'm not going to read all of this but in sum the IMF's lending policies have varied substantially over the last two decades in response to variations in the composite of international capital flows. Changes in the patterns of financial globalization shape the preferences of both key actors involved in IMF decision making, G5 governments and the fund's professional staff. In turn, IMF lending behaviors varies over time and between cases in accordance with shifts in the composition of private international lending to the funds borrowers countries see one of the the, the 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 rulers if you will of the fund is the private international lending and why they are in bed with a corrupt and unsustainable banking system and financial markets and it, this will, this house of cards will eventually collapse. I know everybody, eh? all of my entourage, all of the 10 percenters around the world don't want to listen to me. I mean, a one percenter who's a traitor uh, said, well, lady, can you tell me when the collapse will come? And I said, sure. You give me a bunch of economists and, and we start looking at all of the different you know issues because there is a lot to look at and statistics but it's all out there i've seen it in drips and drabs all over the place the hedge funds i follow hedge fund uh you know these hedge fund guys not because i'm going to invest my money in there first off they took it all so i don't have any right now um but uh because they're right on target on a lot. Believe me, when the Nuremberg Trials 2 starts, the hedge fund guys, well, they're going to be on some problems because you guys are cashing in, cashing in, cashing in. Why aren't you, you know, using your knowledge to help me and hold anybody to account here? So once again, when we went into RICO, it's going to be easy breezy to get them up on the stand and talking about and, 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 and hanging out your asses to dry uh, to protect their own asses. See, this is how the Machiavellian game works. Want to play hardball? This is hardball. And really, you idiot men in Washington, you really should be more careful about the women that you marry, that you have affairs with, and that you hire in your companies. Because those little cackling hens are creating more and more chaos and more and more chaos. You got already a bad situation with managerialism, but then you got the alpha dominance feminists who just want to get into the positions of power, affirmative action, who just want the browns, the blacks, and the, the, the yellows, and the reds into positions of power, and let's all start fighting over who's going to be the new dominators. That's what's happening. And everybody's complicit. So, uh, 
Now, a day of reckoning will come. And, you know, regardless, even if you do shut me up and, and you know, lock her up, lock her up. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm already locked down. I've, I've been hanging out for now almost uh, 13 years just working, 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 working with my books. And uh, see, this, this is one of the things that I know, I know from experience. My mother, it was the same issue when the, 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 at the end of, um, at the very end for them, they, I mean, they had to give up a whole bunch of books and my mom was so upset when they went into the, the, the nursing home, the little sisters of the poor. See, over indebtedness, and in the, the poor house, always. Uh, they had 3,000 books. And one of the things that always was just, uh, you know, made my mother so so jealous of my father and why she played the same game. You guys are playing with me and my siblings are playing with me. The denigration, shut up, stupid, insulting, all of that. Um, out of jealousy. And you guys are playing the same thing. You know, sure, you got all of these books, you got all of this you know, knowledge, 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 but nobody knows how to put it together. And they know that I do. So they want to keep me, you know, out of their little cashing in game. And, uh, I mean, I, I just, you know, vote Quinby Ann Wilcox for president. <laughs> I can't, I mean, I can't wait to hear farther down the road what my my siblings are, are are doing and all of that my younger sibling called me last night and I was like oh gosh okay you guys are getting nervous aren't you threw me bone I was like okay thanks thanks for your little bone but uh I think that the house of cards is going to collapse and the truth is going to be exposed uh, before I might need your bone so, uh, you know, I guess it's all in God's hands. And, and, I mean, they keep on saying, oh, he's got a plan, he's got a plan. I said, well, I think he does. I mean, I think actually the COVID was a wake-up call for not only the United States and all the narcissists, but for all of the narcissists, the, 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 the numbers, one of the reasons that we have such high numbers is all of the narcissists who, well, I... I don't want them to stop me from jet setting. I'm going to go to my restaurants. I'm going to go to my, my, my stores and buy the stuff, you know, the new clothes and the new beauty products and hang out at the country club or go out on my yacht. I'm not going to be locked up. I think a lot of people are, are going to, uh, to pay a heavy price for that attitude. And uh, maybe maybe at the end of this, the world will, will, you know, take a moment and reflect on on the world, the, the, the road that everybody is going down. And this is, you know, one percenters, 10 percenters, you're at the lead. But the 90 percenters, you also have a say, you're, you're the majority. You step up and you start, you know, reclaiming your rights and in a peaceful, dignified manner, but it needs to be done. Because I know too many people amongst the, the 10 percenters and one percenters and they are not going to give up their cushy lifestyle and their homes and you know the, 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 the all of their material wealth uh, willingly nobody believe me I've been knocking on doors for 15 years amongst all of these people now nobody is of good faith nobody so uh, 
I, 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 you know, I pray for the future of this world. Because I didn't bring my two sons into this world to be used as cannon fodder. Even if all of my siblings, all of my old friends, uh, everybody that I've ever known, you know, they don't care. I do. I do, and I care about the rest of the world. Everybody's always criticizing me that, that like my dad, I was too good for this world. I do enjoy helping people, but I am not a person to be crossed. I'm not a stupid idiot. Stupid brunette. Uh, you know, never was. And I can figure anything out, uh, given enough time and enough information. And I figured out this whole, whole little house of cards and cesspool, how it's, how it's constructed. And it's, it's, uh, not constructed well. So, uh, stay safe. Have a nice evening. Bye-bye.